Nathan Joseph Villagomez Pete was born on February 12, 1982, in the village of Tamuning on the west coast of the island of Guam, which belongs to the United States of America. Tamuning is the economic center of Guam, the largest paradise island in Micronesia, located in the Pacific Ocean. The island is quite small, and the population does not exceed 170,000. The main source of income for the island is tourism, with many people flying there each year to enjoy the clean beaches and visit the historical sites preserved from the Spanish colonial era. Nathan belonged to a large and loving family. He was the fourth child, and in total, there were five children, Matthew, Anthony, Eric, Nathan himself, and Sela. Their parents were Camela de Villa Gomez and Mateo Pete. From birth, Nathan was a wonderful child who never caused any trouble. He grew up loving and kind, was a good student, and very curious. Nathan always respected his teachers, usually sat in the front row, and never missed a lesson. Nathan was a typical islander, from a young age, he was inseparably connected to the sea, spending time on the beach, surfing, or just enjoying the sun. As Nathan grew older, he became more popular, people loved him, and he managed to build a large circle of friends in his hometown. Nathan was known for his sense of humor, always laughed contagiously, and showed with every cell of his body how much he loved life. After finishing elementary school, Nathan attended South High School in the neighboring town of Santa Rita, where he met Michelle and Chaka, a girl who had three siblings, Melissa, Melania, and Anthony Chaker. This family was also friendly and loving. After meeting his teenagers, Nathan and Michelle never separated again, they studied together, supported each other in everything, and it was not surprising that their friendship eventually turned into a love relationship. When Michelle was 16, her mother fell seriously ill and Deborah was flown off the island, but unfortunately, she could not be saved. The woman died far from her family, and her children could not say goodbye to her. Facing the unexpected death of their mother, Michelle's older sister Melissa took on the role of mother and helped raise her siblings. From day one, Michelle was a great support and very helpful around the house and with the upbringing of the young ones. During this process, Nathan was always by the side of his beloved girl. In 2000, after they both completed their studies, Nathan proposed to her. Since they had no money for a wedding, they decided to just move in together and start a life together. They were so in love that they couldn't wait to start building their own house. At that time, Nathan worked as a receptionist in a hotel, but with his salary, they could not cover all expenses in a month, and they were about to give birth to their first child, whom they later named Da. Now that he was a father, he wanted to provide his family with everything they needed. This desire eventually led to Nathan's decision to become a soldier and join the Air Force. Nathan completed his training in 2003 and was immediately sent to Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage, the most populous city in Alaska, in the northwest of the United States. Nathan left his home island, but now the family had a lot of money, which allowed him to build a new house where their second child, a daughter named Niara, was born in 2006. Six years after their engagement, Michelle and Nathan could finally celebrate the wedding they had dreamed of for so long. That same year, Nathan was transferred to Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona, where he served as team leader of the weapons team for the A-10 Thunderbolt and the 358th Squadron. There he also received training in logistics and material management, which led to a promotion and new tasks in 2007. At the end of 2007, Nathan moved with his wife and their two children to Nellis Air Force Base near Las Vegas, Nevada. At this base, he rose from Staff Chief of the 99th Logistics Squadron to Deputy Noncommissioned Officer in charge of the Supply Department for maintaining fighter jets. Soon, the family had two more children, first Dran and then Devon. In 2009, Michelle considered Las Vegas the perfect place to stay and raise their children there permanently. For this reason, 
Nathan used his savings to make a down payment on a beautiful 730 square meter house in a quiet and pleasant suburb about 50 kilometers from the air regiment. At that time, Michelle was only a housewife, and the income of Sergeant Neon was not enough to provide the family with a luxurious life, although they could cover all expenses. The two were ambitious and over time spent more than they earned, which soon led to financial difficulties that severely affected their marital happiness. In mid-2009, Nathan decided to participate in the war between the USA and Iraq. Originally, the young man was supposed to spend only six months there, but eventually, he decided to continue his service after realizing that he was benefiting his country and his salary was significantly higher. Michelle, in turn, took a part-time job at a credit card telemarketing company during this time. Michelle did this not only to have more money but also to alleviate her anxiety about the fact that her husband was in a war zone and something terrible could happen to him at any moment, leaving her and their four children on their own. In addition to her new job, Michelle enrolled in a cosmetics school, hoping to become a professional beautician and open her own business. But as soon as Nathan left for Iraq, Michelle had a secret lover. She felt that the youthful love between her and her husband was no longer there and entered into a relationship with a colleague named Michael Rudolph Rodriguez. He was 31 years old at the time and had had short prison sentences in 2007 and 2008 for forgery and attempted theft. He was an incorrigible womanizer who loved to seduce women, for which he even received the nickname Soft Rick. Michelle could not resist the passion and male attention of this man and plunged headlong into this dangerous relationship. When Nathan returned from Iraq at the end of 2009, it seemed as if their marriage had withstood the distance and their togetherness had become even stronger. However, this was not the case. Michelle played the role of the loving wife in a despicable way and dreamed of starting a new life with her lover. At the same time, Nathan knew nothing about his wife's infidelity and devoted himself entirely to the well-being of the family. For this reason, the 20-year-old non-commissioned officer took a night shift job to earn twice as much and provide for his wife and the four children, who were then between two and nine years old. At the same time, the man began coaching a team of children aged five to seven, teaching them a simplified version of the sport of baseball. Although Michelle no longer wanted to be with Nathan, she did not try to leave him. She knew that in the event of a divorce, she would be left with nothing, and she also knew that in the event of her husband's death, she would receive $400,000 from the U.S. Army. Moreover, Nathan's life was insured under a policy for $250,000, and this knowledge led Michelle to the terrible plan to take her husband's life. In October 2010, Michelle and her lover began developing a strategy to execute their plan. At that time, they enlisted the help of Corey Alexis Hawkins, a friend of Michael's, a 30-year-old contract killer with nine previous convictions in his criminal record. These convictions included burglary and auto theft in 1995, serious theft in 1996, deadly burglary in 2000, and fraudulent use of a credit card in 2000. Corey was an experienced criminal and offered his services as a contract killer to Michelle and Michael, for which he demanded $20,000, and the couple agreed. Later, Corey's girlfriend, the 30-year-old Jessica, joined the plan. The planned murder was to shoot Nathan in his Chevy Tahoe and then drive the car with the body to the parking lot of the apartment complex cover the car with a blanket, and bury the body. Jessica set out to buy the special items they needed to execute the crime, including men's gloves, a blanket for the car, and a strong perfume to cover the smell of the decomposing body. The next step was to find an alibi for Michael. For this purpose, she approached her friend Shannon, a former erotic actress, to ask her to testify in court to corroborate the criminal's statements about Michael's whereabouts on the day of the crime. In return, Jessica promised Shannon 5% of the money that she and her boyfriend would receive from Michael. On Thanksgiving Day in November 2010, Nathan and his family were visited by his brother Eric and his fiancée Veronica. On that day, 
the guests sensed the tensions between the couple, which until then had been considered perfect. For Veronica and Eric, it was quite obvious that the love and understanding between Michelle and Nathan had completely disappeared. They barely tolerated each other and obviously had financial problems since their pantry and refrigerator were almost empty. It was Wednesday, December 1, 2010. Michelle went to her cosmetics school after work, from where she came home at 10 p.m., only five minutes before Nathan was supposed to leave for the Air Force Base. But that day, everything was a little different. Michelle reported that she was not feeling well, so she left work and went straight home around 5.30 p.m. When she got home, she saw her husband sleeping on the couch. Michelle woke Nathan up and suggested that they sleep together in bed for a while, which they did. For some reason, Nathan's alarm clock did not ring, and he only woke up at 11 p.m., shocked. He immediately went to take a shower and then to the garage to put on his uniform. When he was done with his preparations, it was 11.30 p.m., and he should have been halfway to work by then. At about the same time, Michelle texted her lover to inform him about everything her husband was doing. They decided to carry out their plan that same day. At that time, Michael and Corey were sitting in a black Cadillac parked directly in front of their future victim's house, waiting for Nathan. The perpetrators were already wearing blue latex gloves on their hands so that their fingerprints could not be traced. Finally, Nathan said goodbye to his family and prepared to leave the garage. At the same moment, Michelle texted Michael about the completion of a planned deal with a client named F. Dyke, which was obviously a codename. While Nathan was still in the garage, Michael approached him from behind and shot him five times in the back. Although the man was mortally wounded, he found the strength to enter the house, but as soon as he did, he fell dead in front of his wife and children, who were very frightened by the sound of the shots and the fact that their father was bleeding to death in front of their eyes. Michelle immediately called emergency services, screaming that her husband was bleeding to death. The paramedic instructed the woman on how to revive Nathan, but it was too late for him. Nathan was immediately taken to the hospital, where the doctors did everything in their power to save him, but unfortunately, the man was unable to survive his injuries. The most severe wound was caused by a bullet that hit him in the neck. Michelle was hysterical as her husband was taken to the hospital and looked completely devastated when she learned of his death. Of course, it was all just an act, because just a few hours later, she sent her lover a text message with a smiling smiley face. The perpetrators, in turn, went to a previously agreed-upon apartment after the attack, where they used the fireplace to burn their clothes and destroy the evidence. Michael then went with Shannon to a hotel to confirm his alibi, while Jessica, in the meantime, thoroughly cleaned the room to destroy all the evidence. The employees of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department were shocked by the brutality of the crime that had occurred in a quiet suburb. When investigator Todd Williams arrived at the scene, he found that the garage doors were not locked. There was a lot of blood inside, with stains around the bench where Nathan had put on his shoes, as well as on several doors of his car, on the floor, and on the walls of the garage. Moreover, a bloody military uniform was found on the floor near the spot where the victim's keys and wallet were found. All this ruled out the idea of a botched robbery. Michelle was then asked to tell what had happened that day. The woman told the investigator that she had heard loud noises when her husband rushed into the garage. At that time, she did not realize what had happened because she and her children were frightened. A little later, a stumbling Nathan entered the house and collapsed in front of them, bleeding. During the conversation, Michelle admitted that they were in financial difficulties, so the investigators wondered whether Nathan was hiding a secret, such as a gambling addiction, the threat of an extortionist, or an affair with another woman, which could explain why someone would want to take the life of a model soldier. Eventually, the evidence suggested that someone had waited for the right moment before he went to work. It did not look like a random robbery. 
An examination of the man's phone, however, revealed no clues or evidence. All that could be found on the phone were pictures of his wife and children. In Guam, his parents boarded the first flight out of Las Vegas, full of grief. Camelita cried throughout the flight. When they finally reached the city, Michelle threw herself into the arms of her mother-in-law and fainted, but the woman immediately sensed that her reaction was fake. Meanwhile, the two men continued to destroy possible evidence. They destroyed the phones of all those involved in the crime, including Shannon, and reminded her that she had to confirm Michael's alibi in court. The investigation continued, and the investigators questioned neighbors who had been nearby at the time of the crime. Several of them reported that they had seen a man in a brown hoodie quickly leaving the scene of the crime in a black car after the shots were fired. When the investigators asked Michelle about the car, she suddenly mentioned that her colleague Michael had a similar car. The police decided to pay attention to this and looked into Michael's file, finding out that he had an extensive criminal past. This made the police suspicious, so they invited the man for questioning. Michael agreed and answered all the questions there. He told a story that he had come up with his accomplices. Allegedly, he had gone shopping at the supermarket that day and had met a woman named Shannon around 9 p.m. According to Michael's statements, they talked for a long time, and when they felt attracted to each other, they decided to go to a hotel to have sex. The man added that they arrived at the hotel around 11 p.m., and the woman later confirmed his statements. However, the investigators felt that something was not right here, so they examined the data from Michael's and Michelle's phones and found their correspondence, which they had also been leading for a year. In a report from the phone company, they were able to find exactly the messages they had exchanged on the evening of the tragedy. Michael wrote that he hoped for a quick conclusion of the contract with Van Dyke, which was supposed to take place the next day. Two minutes later, the man added that she should let him know if she could take a few days off and that he appreciated her help in concluding the contract. At 11.19 p.m., Michelle replied to the message, saying that her husband had just woken her up and that they had apparently overslept his alarm clock. She added that the man had run out the door and would be leaving the house shortly, then added laughing that he would probably be late for work. Then Michelle wrote that she was sorry that Michael had been so involved in a responsibility. However, they did not have enough evidence to charge Michael or Michelle and had to let the man go. Michelle was then summoned for questioning again. Under the insight and pressure of the investigator, the woman broke down and revealed her secret affair with Michael. According to the woman, Michael had started planning two months before the crime to take Nathan's life so that she could receive a high payout from her husband's insurance policy and start a life together. Michelle said that she initially agreed to carry out the plan, but later changed her mind and tried to prevent the execution of the bloody plan. Therefore, she did not open the car in the garage as Michael had asked her to and also turned off Nathan's alarm clock, hoping that the criminals would be gone by the time they woke up. The investigators did not believe the woman's remorse. The correspondence clearly indicated that she had been actively involved in the plan. Later, new evidence confused the case. On December 7, Shannon appeared at the police station and revealed that Michael had forced her to give him an alibi for the night of the shooting. The woman stated that her friend Jessica had asked her to help two men she knew rob a dealer of illegal substances and that she would help cover up their involvement. In return, Jessica offered her 5% of Michael's profit. Shannon assured her, however, that she had agreed to help them because she thought the victim was a dangerous criminal. Shannon then revealed that she had met Michael at her friend's apartment on the night after the events that led to Nathan's death. When they arrived there, Michael confessed to her that he had shot his victim. When the two returned to the friend's apartment the next day, where they had met the day before, the woman noticed a strong smell of cleaning products and saw that the fireplace was completely clean and all three phones had been destroyed. Shannon assured the police that as soon as she found out what had happened, 
She immediately decided to confess everything to the authorities and added in tears that she was very afraid for her life after the confession. The police obtained footage from the hotel's surveillance camera, which showed that Michael and Shannon had arrived at the scene about 40 minutes after the crime. This confirmed the woman's statement, so the police decided to search the apartment of Corey, whom Shannon had identified as Michael's accomplice. They managed to obtain a search warrant. At about the same time, Jessica admitted to having bought latex gloves, a car cover, and an air freshener, all items they wanted to use in the attack. Simultaneously with the investigations, on Tuesday, December 7, 2010, the family and friends of his wife gathered in the chapel at the Air Force Base to honor and appreciate the sergeant. Colonel Sean Henderson, Nathan's squadron commander, praised the young airman's service to the Air Force and spoke of the merits the man had brought to his country. Nathan's other comrades praised his high work ethic, motivation, passion, and dedication. His learning ability and commitment to his profession also characterized him as a modest man who was a role model and inspired his colleagues. Eric, Nathan's brother, spoke of the love and unconditional support that Nathan had shown him throughout his life. With tears in his eyes, he said that he knew no one or could imagine anyone who would not want to be friends with Nathan and that he was a man who loved life and surfing. Eric added that Nathan had never forgotten his roots and was proud of his service to his country, was a good person who liked to have fun, and simply loved his wife and four children. The next day, on December 8, Michael Rodriguez, Corey Hawkins, and Jessica Austin were arrested on charges of murder with a firearm and conspiracy to murder and robbery without bail and taken to the Clark County Detention Center in Nevada. The next day, Michelle was also arrested under the same conditions and placed under observation to prevent her from committing suicide. On the same day Michelle was arrested, December 9, Nathan's body was transferred to Guam and buried there. Only his family and an honor guard from the Air Force base attended the ceremony. On Wednesday, December 15, 2010, a funeral mass was held at the Church of St. Francis in Tamuning, where Nathan's family, friends, and colleagues said goodbye to him. Subsequently, military honors were bestowed upon him at the Veterans Cemetery in Petiguam. Nathan's motorcade consisted of motorcycles. Upon arrival, Six officers carried the coffin, covered with the flag of the United States of America, from the hearse and brought it to Nathan's final resting place. Family and friends surrounded him to say their final goodbye, and just before the funeral, a salute was fired. Just over a month after Nathan's death, on Tuesday, January 4, 2011, charges of conspiracy to commit murder and robbery with a firearm, as well as murder with a firearm, were brought against the four defendants in Clark County District Court. Charges of possession of a firearm were additionally brought against two men. Each of the defendants denied involvement in the crime and assembled their own defense teams. Over the next three years, several trial dates were scheduled, which, however, were postponed for various reasons. Michelle's lawyer, Christina Weed, filed various motions, one of which aimed to exclude evidence related to the woman's phone on the grounds that the analysis of the phone had been conducted without a search warrant. According to court documents, some of the evidence on the phones was lost, but the police officers kept their own records of this evidence. On this basis, the defense attorney also requested that these pieces of evidence be removed from the proceedings due to lack of evidence preservation or destruction. However, all these motions were denied and the trial was scheduled for September 2015. At the same time, Jessica Austin reached a deal with the prosecution after she was found guilty of conspiracy to murder. The trial finally took place on September 21, 2015. Michael Rudolph Rodriguez was the first of the defendants to stand trial. The prosecutor told the jurors in detail that Michael had shot Nathan while he was on his way to work, J. Manson Bauman said he had been walking his dog that night and initially, everything had been very quiet when suddenly five shots rang out. Just a few seconds after the shots, 
he saw a black Cadillac speeding away from the scene. In the end, Michael pleaded guilty to avoid the death penalty. On September 29, 2015, the man was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He was also denied the right to appeal his sentence. During the sentencing, Michael looked straight ahead and showed no emotion as he learned of his sentence. A month later, the trial against Michelle took place in a court in Las Vegas. During the questioning, the defense attorney asked Michelle whether she had known that Michael Rodriguez was going to take her husband's life that night. The woman denied this and stated that Michael had forced her to do what led to Nathan's death and that the entire plan had gotten out of control. Prosecutor Michelle Fleck later rejected the defendant's defense, saying that the syndrome of the lonely and bored wife was no excuse for her actions. When Michelle was allowed to say a few words during the trial, the woman turned to Nathan's parents in tears, apologized to them, said that she loved him and their children, and then fainted. Michelle then pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder with a firearm. Through this confession, Michelle, like Michael, was able to avoid the death penalty. The victim's family also asked the court to waive the death penalty for Michelle. In her closing argument, the judge described the crime as incomprehensible and unbelievable and stated that she could not believe that Michelle continued to sleep next to her husband even though she knew he was exposed to an imminent and unnecessary death. The judge also noted that she did not believe Michelle had tried to sabotage the plan and found that much evidence suggested that the woman was far more involved than she was willing to admit. In October 2015, it was Corey Alexis Hawkins' turn. He also agreed to a deal to avoid the death penalty. His lawyer, Andrea L., asked for leniency to give his client a chance for parole one day. The judge denied the request because he was convinced that Corey had participated in planning the crime and was in close proximity when the murderer pulled the trigger. When the final judgment in the case against Michelle was pronounced in March 2016, the woman made several statements. For example, she stated that she was emotionally vulnerable at the time of the events, which led to major irreparable mistakes. She also expressed, in tears, her hope that everyone would be able to forgive her one day. Nathan's mother, Camelida, who had become the guardian of her four grandchildren, also had the opportunity to speak during the trial. She told her daughter-in-law that she had forgiven her because she was a religious woman and could see that Michelle's soul needed this. Camelida then spoke about the effects that Michelle's actions and Nathan's death had had on her children. Camelida said that despite therapy, the children still got scared when they heard loud noises and feared that their mother might do something to them, just as she had done to their father. Nathan's mother concluded her speech by asking the judge to sentence Michelle to life imprisonment without parole. Eric also commented on the sentencing of his sister-in-law, saying that they did not wish her death. He said it was enough for them that Michelle knew they would all live without her and that her children would grow up knowing what their mother had done. Eric's wife, Veronica, told Michelle that she hated her but that she simply did not deserve to spend another day outside and added that she did not deserve the last name Pete. Michelle was eventually sentenced to life imprisonment at the Floors Moore Women's Correctional Facility in Las Vegas. Corey's sentence of life imprisonment without parole was confirmed a few months later, on September 20, 2016, in Las Vegas. Michelle had completely destroyed her life full of love by chasing after greed in a man she barely knew. Four children lost their father, and a war veteran died just because his wife forgot that the youthful love she had had since high school was something truly beautiful and unique. Now, Michelle and Nathan's four children are growing up in the love and care of their paternal grandparents in their father's hometown in Guam but their lives have also been profoundly affected by their mother's actions. This truly cruel act has destroyed many lives. The innocent Nathan, who had always done his best for his family, died at the hands of his wife's lover, and now their children are forever traumatized by what happened to them. 
it was incredibly lucky that all the criminals were convicted and had no claim to the money that would have been due to them after Nathan's death. Now the criminals will never leave prison and will be in a place where they actually belong. Thank you for watching and take care of yourself.